Uh, Bob Allen of the Robert Allen Law Firm is a senior partner and founder at Robert Allen, which has offices in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and Palm Beach. He has extensive experience advising clients in the yachting industry. We all know who Robert Allen is and is the principal legal, legal advisor in the Americas for some of the leading yacht manufacturers in the world, as well as for the largest yacht brokerage firms in the United States. Robert Allen Lawyers uh, has regularly advised yacht owners, buyers, sellers, brokers, lenders, as well as leading yacht manufacturers. He advises the FIBA, he's very close to FIBA in the forms, development of our trade agreements, our standardized sales, listing, purchase and sale agreements. And he was on the winning side, which that's a good story, in the Bush versus Gore litigation, ran for Congress, and is listed as one of the top lawyers in South Florida. Enjoys the Bahamas, and he owns a Bertram 410. And he's the provider of these really cool power banks for your cell phones right here, too. Robert. <laughs> morning. I ran for Congress and lost. <laughs> I'm listening to some of the speakers today, and particularly Melanie right now, is thinking about the first deal that I ever was involved with. I was a first-year associate at my firm, and the senior partner called me and said, hey, uh, there's going to be some guys showing up at our office. I won't be there today. I want you to handle uh, the payment. And uh, some guys showed up at the office, and they came in with bags from Publix, and they were full of $20 bills. The purchase price on the deal was $300,000. And I called the senior partner. I said, hey, I'm not counting $300,000 worth of you know, cash. And he said, don't worry about it. Just give them a receipt. Make them sign that you know, they didn't require you to, to uh, count it and you know, get it down to the bank immediately. So things have changed a little bit, right? We don't do cash deals anymore. Thinking also about what Melanie said about uh, your risks on the money laundering thing, we got a call last week or in the last 10 days, an existing client asked us if we would serve as an escrow agent on a transaction. That's where I'm thinking it may affect brokerages. Um, they wanted us to receive uh, $2 million. They were doing a transaction in another country. And uh, if we could just be the escrow agent. And we've actually done that before when uh, the piece of property is in South America and Ecuador, and there's two Ecuadorian families. One of them's our client. The other one's represented by a lawyer we know. They want to pay for it in the States. That's not normal. But this was a currency swap. I, we Actually, we uh, before I knew the details, we opened the file. You know, we. You know, sent them an engagement letter. They signed it. And then I asked the lawyer involved, what's, what's this about? He said, well, they're going to be doing a, a, a currency swap, and it involves a Chinese company, and they want local currency. And I said, what? I said, we don't really do that kind of stuff. And I said, and let me talk to the client. And he said, yeah, we're going to, it's not $2 million, it's $4 million, or we've been doing two a month. And I said, uh, well, tell me a little bit more. He said, yeah, each deal we pay a commission on $4 million of 750000 and I said, I'm sorry, you know, we really can't uh, help you. You know something fishy was going on. I don't know how that translates into the use or abuse of a brokerage's escrow account. But the bottom line is, if it, if it feels and smells fishy, you know, and you're going to make a decent fee on the deal, you know, it's just not worth it. It's just absolutely not worth it. Uh, the subject of my talk is helping brokers close a deal, how a lawyer can help a yacht broker close a deal. And there's a parenthesis in it that says, believe it or not. Uh, uh, yesterday at our uh, law firm staff meeting, we have these every Tuesday at noon, um, they asked me what I was going to talk about. And I said, the subject of my talk is lawyers are idiots. And nobody laughed. I figured we might get a laugh or two here. Uh, as a lawyer for the yacht industry, I've come to realize that yacht brokers have certain preconceptions about lawyers. The first one is that you believe that getting a lawyer involved in a transaction is a bad idea. <laughs> I 
because the lawyer is going to complicate things. In other words, lawyers are idiots. I think there's a picture of an idiot over there. Okay. Well, that's the idiot. Where's the clicker? I don't know how to use this thing. I'm an idiot. Can you handle it? And you especially believe, the second reality is that uh, getting a lawyer involved in the deal before you sign a contract, before the parties sign a contract, that's an absolutely terrible idea. The third reality is that you hate to read contracts. It's a pain in the neck to read all that fine print, and it was written by a bunch of lawyers, and they're idiots anyway. A fourth reality is that most of you have probably not read the FYBA contract every word through and then sat down to talk to a yacht lawyer about it. Why? Because, you know, it's boring. And who has time? And lawyers are idiots. In this context, the word idiot means someone who thinks they're smart but really doesn't have a clue about how to get a deal done. And it's perfectly understandable that you would think that way because most lawyers are idiots. That's, that's our firm on the elevator, the lawyers. We're having a good time. Just taking your money for nothing. <laughs> now, now that we understand each other, uh, there's certain practical situations that a yacht broker should consider because the business being what it is, you're going to run into situations where you can screw things up. First, what do you do when your client asks you a question about what a sentence in a contract means? Like, for example, oh, I think that's the wrong picture. Oh, that's... <laughs> I just read it just for fun. Any party which is a legal entity will provide to the other party or to the other prior to closing proof that it's in good standing under the laws of the state or other jurisdiction under which the entity has been formed, a consent action or resolution demonstrating the entity's duly authorized decision to purchase the vessel and a power of attorney demonstrating the authority of the individual delivering or accepting the vessel or executing this agreement and or purchase and sales documents. How are you supposed to know what proof of good standing is? Do you really know what proof of good standing is? The dock agent looked at it, we're good. What is the consent action or resolution supposed to say and what's the difference? And what constitutes a valid power of attorney? Are you going to assume responsibility for these documents? The point is a lawyer can answer those questions and take the burden off of you. And instead of not worrying about it by putting it out of your mind, you can wor not worry about it because you know a lawyer's on it. It's not on you. I'll give you an example. We did a deal not long ago, and the boat was in Cyprus. The boat was owned by a Cyprus corporation. How do you as a lawyer determine that a Cyprus corporation is, I mean, as a broker, determine that a Cyprus corporation is in good standing? The documents were in Greek. If the seller is depending on you, or the buyer is depending on you, what are you going to do? Call somebody you know in Greece? Call somebody you know that speaks Greek? We happen to have a Greek-speaking lawyer in our firm, I'll just let you know. But uh, what about the power of attorney? You've seen a power of attorney that darn things in Greek, and it has a bunch of seals and stamps on it, right? If you've got two or three seals, it's good. And what if they tell you, as they did to us, hey, wire the money to this Russian lady 
who somebody says owns the Greek company, uh, the Cyprus company, that owns the boat, because she got the boat in a divorce with a Russian billionaire. Let's do it, man. Let's just send it. Who needs a lawyer? Who needs, and our, I mean, does that make you dizzy? It made me dizzy, but you know, I get paid for getting dizzy. The dizzier I get, the more money I charge. <laughs> but let's forget about Cyprus and Russia. Let's just talk about a regular deal in Florida where the seller is Big Boat LLC, and somebody gives you a document that says you can wire the money to Mr. Jones because he's the, quote, owner of Big Boat LLC. How do you know that document's right? Maybe Mr. Jones has a brother, Mr. Jones, who owns half of the company. How do you know? Do you want that responsibility? How many of you have had a situation where a boat got sold? Then the wife shows up and says, hey, I didn't agree to sell that boat. Where's my money? That's a forged Signature on that document. I've dealt with that situation, okay? There's still depositions going on about that situation. I don't know how many of you guys have been deposed, but the boat business has changed. It used to be I was the owner of a 41-foot barge or a man. That was a big boat when I was a kid. I keep getting older, and that boat keeps getting smaller. And that's the way the business we're in is. It just keeps getting bigger through the grace of God, because, you know, the commissions get bigger. And then you can afford lawyers. Maybe they're not idiots. But Sometimes yacht brokers think only a buyer needs a lawyer because, after all, the seller's getting the money. And what do they care as long as they get the money? Well, here's an example why a seller needs a lawyer. A clause in the FYBA agreement that says seller represents and warrants that he's going to transfer the boat good and free and clear of all liens and encumbrances and all that stuff. You've got to deliver the boat, not you. The seller has to deliver it free and clear. Well, hey, guess what? The FYBA contract says you're going to sell it free and clear of all liens. But what if the boat's in Europe? And what if it's not an American built boat? And it's coming to the United States. And what's the customs duty on 18 million bucks? Or 17 million, my math's not good. Trey's around here, he does the numbers for us. 270 grand, but if you structure this deal wrong, it's easy to structure it right. You just pick up the phone and call Howard S. Reader and Associates, and I know I met somebody here from another customs brokerage, I have to say hi. But you structure it right, there's no 270. You structure it wrong, all of a sudden, in this particular case, the yacht broker was too smart to need a lawyer. It's pretty easy, but it's not unless you know what you're doing. Here's another situation everybody can, uh, deals with, the conditional acceptance. And a few years ago, there was a lawyer made a talk to somebody at one of the brokerages and said, you can't write a conditional acceptance because that's practicing law. And, uh, you know, they said that's ridiculous. And for the most part, it is ridiculous uh, because most of the time, the conditional acceptance says, hey, I'm good with a boat if you reduce the price 100000 Fix, fix the ice maker, fix the AC, or something like that. That's, that's nothing. But we just had a customer come to us on a pretty big boat. They were referred by a broker, but the broker was really smart. They didn't get us involved before the contract was signed. And the conditional acceptance had been signed. And the conditional said, what did it say? Return the two leather Barcelona-type chairs Right? Extend the closing date and something else. The conditional acceptance said, return the two Barcelona chairs. We have a picture of Barcelona chairs. Now, let me tell you what we had to deal with afterwards and we, we would normally put in a conditional acceptance. We have it. 
Just like banking has gotten more complicated, boating has gotten more complicated. The bigger the boat, more doggone certificates and licenses and permits and all that kind of junk you need. Now, we got the deal done. But once again, through the grace of God, things that get complicated pay us a lot of money. If you, if you, if it, I, I boil things down to this. Uh, a broker knows what his customer or her customer wants, sometimes better than what the customer knows. But the lawyer knows what the customer needs. Now, I get back in the end to what's the broker's most important job. And I know we're not supposed to take questions right now, but can, I just want somebody to yell out, what's the broker's most important job? The broker's most important job. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Jeff. Good job. Anybody got an idea? Okay, close it, close it. All right, so I got these answers from some very experienced people, but they're all wrong. The right answer is focus on the customer and keep the customer from freaking out. There are a lot of moving parts in a deal. And it's important that a broker help coordinate getting things done. But a lot of brokers are running around doing a million things outside the boat and then going inside the air-conditioned part of the boat telling the customer everything's good. And then they're running out there and they're talking to a surveyor about the problems with the survey. And then they're having to deal with the bank. And then they got the lawyer. Oh man, the other guy size got a lawyer. They're running around like crazy. And then they walk in there and oh, everything's cool. And how many of you have had to worry about getting ripped off on a commission? I mean, how many times have you had to think about that? The commission is only one of the moving parts. You ought to get a lawyer looking at the doggone survey and looking at the uh, conclusions and seeing what do we need to put in the conditional acceptance. How are we going to structure it? A conditional acceptance is nothing but an amendment to a contract. The more money is at stake, the more issues with a boat, you can get that dadgum boat sold, but you got to put in the right terms. And then you're thinking about the flag thing. What do you know about the flag thing? Some of you guys know about the flag thing, but your lawyers are on the phone with these registries all the time and they, they play golf with you and they play golf with them. They can sort out where you should be or which registry needs an original document and which one you can get done on a scan document. Because sometimes you gotta get it done on a scan document. And then maybe you're gonna go into a registry that's a little less cool than another registry in terms of preserving the value of the boat, but then you can switch it to the other registry. You wanna be thinking about that? And then, as I said, if the other side has a lawyer, what happens if they're not a boat lawyer? Holy Moses, you've dealt with those guys. You're ahead of yourself. Go back. He's a boat lawyer. <laughs> what if they're not a boat lawyer? I've had deals where the other side has some guy, you know, he's a great lawyer. He's a genius. A lot smarter than me. He went to Harvard and everything. But, and they're selling shopping centers and office buildings. And they start sticking in 27 different changes into the FYBA agreement. And you know how many weeks it takes to get them to realize, oh, well, that's the way it has to be because we've been doing it that way for a long time for a reason, and you don't understand the risks? You want to be dealing with those guys? And then what if they want to fight, right? Now you can flip it. So we got two guys against one right here. And Michael's a great lawyer. He likes to fight. But... If they want to fight, you need to have somebody by your side. All right, but it's not just about fighting.
We had a deal where we had a seller on safari in Africa. And the buyer's lawyer, who's your lawyer, told the broker, hey, we need a document signed. He freaked out. How are we going to get to it? He wasn't on safari in Kenya. He was in like the Central African Empire or something. You couldn't get him to sign a document. So they sent us the documents and we looked and guess what? He didn't need the document. So we talked to the guy and we got the deal done. He didn't need it because it said the same darn thing somewhere else. Anyway, that happens. We had another deal not too long ago where uh, this boat was being sold uh, by somebody in Turkey and the boat was offshore for an offshore closing and uh, it was on a FIBA contract and it said uh, title transfers when money hits the seller's account. But the normal procedure is you're on the boat, you sign a protocol of delivery and acceptance. I deliver the boat, I accept the boat, and then the mon money goes. But the owner said, I don't care what the contract says. And he told the representative on the boat, don't sign anything until the money hits my account. Everybody's freaking out. It's a pretty big deal. What do we do? We figure out, we think about it, you know, first we freak out, and then uh, we think about it, and what's a protocol of delivery and acceptance? Probably everybody here has heard of it, but is it in the statute book that you need a protocol on delivery and acceptance? Is it in the law of the United Kingdom or the European Union or the United States or Florida? If the other side has a lawyer, what happens if they're not a boat lawyer? Holy Moses, you've dealt with those guys. You're ahead of yourself, go back. He's a boat lawyer. <laughs> what if they're not a boat lawyer? I've had deals where the other side has some guy, you know, he's a great lawyer, he's a genius, a lot smarter than me, he went to Harvard and everything. And they're selling shopping centers and office buildings. And they start sticking in 27 different changes into the FYBA agreement. And you know how many weeks it takes to get them to realize, oh, well, that's the way it has to be because we've been doing it that way for a long time for a reason. And you don't understand the risks. You want to be dealing with those guys? And then what if they want to fight, right? Now you can flip it. So we got two guys against one right here. And Michael's a great lawyer, he likes to fight. But if they wanna fight, you need to have somebody by your side. All right, but it's not just about fighting. We had a deal where we had a seller on safari in Africa. And the buyer's lawyer, who's your lawyer? Told the broker, hey, we need a document signed. He freaked out. How are we going to get the? He wasn't on safari in Kenya. He was in like the Central African Empire or something. You couldn't get him to sign a document. So they sent us the documents and we looked and guess what? He didn't need the document. So we talked to the guy and we got the deal done. He didn't need it because it said the same darn thing somewhere else. Anyway, that happens. We had another deal not too long ago where uh, this boat was being sold uh, by somebody in Turkey and the boat was offshore for an offshore closing and uh, it was on a FIBA contract and it said uh, title transfers when money hits the seller's account. But the normal procedure is you're on the boat, you sign a protocol of delivery and acceptance. I deliver the boat, I accept the boat, and then the mon money goes. But the owner said, I don't care what the contract says. And he told the representative on the boat, don't sign anything until the money hits my account. Everybody's freaking out, it's a pretty big deal. What do we do? We figure out, we think about it, you know, first we freak out, and then uh, we think about it, and what's a protocol of delivery and acceptance? Probably everybody here has heard of it, but is it in the statute book that you need a protocol on delivery and acceptance? Is it in the law of the United Kingdom or the European Union or the United States or Florida? There's no law on a protocol of delivery and acceptance. It's a document that says, I deliver and I accept. And we live in the 21st century. So we have to figure out, 
is the captain from Turkey? Where's he from? Because I don't speak, you know, every language we speak a bunch of them, but it turned out the captain was from Italy, which was good, because we knew we could reason with him, because my partner's Italian, but even if he wasn't. But the most important thing was that the captain of the seller was gonna be the captain of the buyer. And so we figured out, we don't need some formal protocol of delivery and acceptance, let's just send texts. Let me have the captain send the, the buyer's rep a text and the, sell, the buyer's rep send a text, take a picture of them and eat, uh, send them to us. Got the deal done, the money got sent. You, you know, if you hadn't had a lawyer involved in that transaction, I mean, I don't know what would have happened, but I've had deals blow up after, you know, the money had been, I've had deals where the, uh, you, some of you might have heard of this, but they were closing the boat and uh, there was a celebratory phone call and they put the speaker phone on the boat. And they didn't tell, I don't know if it was the seller or the buyer, but they didn't tell the other person that they were on a speaker phone and the seller, so I was, oh, that man, that guy's a the buyer, he's a total jerk, you know, whatever. And the buyer's on the boat or whatever. And the deal blew up. I mean, the money had transferred, it was a, it was a lawsuit. It was a great deal for me. But, <laughs> the, uh, anyway. <laughs> if it is the case that despite the fact that lawyers are idiots, they can help you, then, and you decide, okay, I'm gonna have a lawyer, and think about what lawyer you get, okay? Would you rather have a lawyer that your client chooses, or would you rather have a lawyer that you choose? The one you choose knows what they're doing, the lawyer that the client chooses, you don't know. The lawyer one that chooses, that you choose has some loyalty to you. Their legal duty is to their customer, yeah, but what if they're trying to mess with you on the commission? which just happened on a deal, by the way, to an FYBA member. We were doing a deal when uh, this uh, British law firm had the money in deposit, and uh, they, they said, well, we're not gonna wire you your commission. We're gonna give these this proceeds to the Russian seller, because contractually it's the Russian seller's duty to pay the commission. And, you know, the broker was freaking out. He said, how many, this is a big deal. How am I gonna get this money? Am I gonna have to sue somebody in England? What am I gonna do if the deal closes and the money goes to the guy? And, uh, well, you know, I didn't know exactly what we were gonna do, but I knew I was a lawyer and I'd seen some movies with Joe Piscopo and stuff. So, I got on the phone with this big European London-based law firm and I, I told the guy, I said, listen, you know, I've done deals with your firm before, but I want you to know I've never seen this. Never seen this ever in my 36 years or however many years it's been that I've been a lawyer. And this is so egregious, I want you to know I'm gonna sue your law firm, but I'm gonna sue you. I'm gonna sue you because you know that that money belongs to my customer. And you know, we got the deal done, the money came. He, he freaked out, thought I was an idiot, which I am. But uh, we got the money for our customer and uh, well, not for our customer, we got the money for the broker. My customer was a customer, the broker is the broker, but I had my eye out for him. And you want a, a lawyer like that. And then in this industry, you know, the American lawyers, we all know each other. And you know, we have to be tough to each other every once in a while, but in the end, we all like each other and we get along and we get deals done. And when you're dealing with the Brits, uh, they have to put up a show too, but if they've seen you and they see you at the boat shows, they can't be too big of an idiot. But, you know, the, the likelihood is they're gonna know us more than they know you uh, in general, unless you're some of the brokers here who really, really, really kick butt and sell those big boats in Monaco all the time, then they know you really well. Uh, so that's really it. I think we can help you get deals done. I think we can protect you. In my experience, we've been able to do it. And I think that the, uh, the cost of, uh, the cost benefit analysis is one that suggests that it's a prudent thing to do. Thank you.